Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joe Horsecapture, Vice President of Native Collections and Amundsen Curator of Native History and Culture at the Autry Museum of the West. Welcome to today's program with Mark Johnson. The exhibition, When I Remember I See Red, explores how in the late 1960s, California became a beacon of creative freedom, individual expression, and social activism for Native people across the country. The region quickly transformed into a place where Native artists engaged with cultural diversity, historical traditions, and contemporary art to critique its colonial past. As a result, California became a site of artistic achievement in the broader story of Native art. This exhibition features California Native artists who have used their work as a means of cultural resistance and renewal. Many have helped and continue to help restore aspects of ceremony, dance, language, and material culture once in danger of disappearing. Our conversation today is with Mark Johnson, who is co-curator of the exhibition and is currently professor of, of art at the San Francisco State University, where he served as gallery director for 25 years. Man, the story he has to tell. <laughs> He has organized more than 100 exhibitions for colleges, including San Francisco State University, Humboldt State University, the San Francisco Art Institute, and Yale University, as well as for museums, including the San Francisco's De Young Museum and Asian Art Museum, the Crocker, Muse Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, and the Nogichi, am I saying that right? Nordiska Akvael Museet in Sweden. That one, Nordic Watercolor Museum? Yeah, okay, that oh, one. Oh, Noguchi, Noguchi Museum okay, of New right. York. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> the Nordic Watercolor Museum in Sweden and the Shanghai Museum. He is the co-editor of several books, including Asian American Art, A History, 1850 to 1970, published by Stanford University Press, and When I Remember I See Red, American Indian Art and Activism in California, published by the University of California Press. He is also, this is clearly a man who never sleeps, he is also the co-curator of an upcoming retrospective of work of Filipino-American artist Carlos Villa that will open at the Newark Museum of Art February 2022 with a catalog again published by UC Press. Thank you for being here, Mark, and welcome to the Autry. As you know, we are fortunate to host this powerful exhibition and have time and have and at, at time to extend it here, which is fortunate considering the circumstances of the pandemic. In reviewing materials, tweaking and installing the exhibition for this venue, there are several aspects of this project that strikes me. First, the lack of knowledge of those who study Native art as a whole, but how important California Native artists are, which are reflected in this exhibition and how the work has really had a large impact on Native American art as a whole. Secondly, the depth in content and versatility of Native American artists. And lastly, the influence of Frank La Pena, an incredible important figure at so many levels. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much. So I wanna say thank you to Joe for that uh, gracious introduction, and also to recognize that I'm so happy to be here in Los Angeles, speaking from unceded Tongva lands, and also speaking on behalf of California's incredibly rich uh, Native American culture uh, that is being promoted by the current exhibition. So <clears throat> this exhibition was um, many years in development with you, Frank LaPena. Can you kind of, if you don't mind, give us a bit of a history of how this idea came to be? I am excited to give that history because it's been such a long time in coming. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about maybe how I plugged into this, which was that in the decade of the 1980s, I got a job teaching at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California, and was incredibly welcomed into the very strong Indian community there, uh, including uh, invited to the ceremonies, certainly worked with lots of students, and there was a dynamic art scene. Uh, and 
so many people of the art scene invited me to come to exhibitions. And one of my first experiences was I got invited to a card game. I said, you want to come? We're having card game. So I thought, uh, okay, thinking maybe bridge or poker, but of course it was Indian gambling. And, uh, I, it was, a uh, kind of a shock, but, uh, incredibly rich experience to walk into, uh, kind of walk through a door into a completely different cultural context because native culture is so strong, largely because of that generation that you reference that in the late 1960s, relearned the dances that had been shut down by federal authorities in the 1930s by contacting elders and saying, it's time to bring them back. Uh, but anyway, uh, during that time, because I was a professor in the art department, I started organizing some exhibitions because of this incredible art scene that was there and soon met Frank. And so Frank is really the dean of American Indian art in California. He had his first solo show, Nam Tapan Wintu guy, 1960. So he witnessed that incredible flowering that led in the 1960s uh, be, at, at, by showing at exhibition venues like the American Indian Historical Society, founded by Rupert Costo in 1964. And he had organized a sort of a, a look at the relationship of Native American contemporary art to regalia and ceremony and ceremonies in 1984-85 at the Crocker Art Museum. And he said, okay, it's been 10, and in 1994, here's where we started. In 1994, he said, okay, it's time to really think more historically. You know, many of these artists are established now. Let's explore a historical exhibition that tells the story of contemporary art by Native Americans in California. So in 1994, we went to the Crocker Art Museum and met with the curator and the director. And they said, oh, it's a pretty good idea. You know, let's start thinking about fundraising because they had worked with him a decade earlier on a very successful project. But then the curator left and the director left and it went into kind of suspended animation. So we thought it's not gonna happen there. Frank continued to develop other projects. He continued to put out books, but he always said, we really need to tell a historical story because some of the generation is passing on. Uh, we walked in Swazo Hines is the first painting we saw there who passed away in 1974. Here we see these wonderful works by Frank Day who passed away in 1976. And of course, as time marches on more and more of those giants uh, were uh, walking on. So we went to four Bay Area museums and none of them said yes until uh, we got a, I got a call from the Crocker and there was a friend of this museum and a friend of the Crocker Art Museum who I want to recognize named Lauren Lipson. And some of you might know Lauren and Lauren said, I'm on the board and let's make it finally happen. So the exhibition, we scheduled it then to mark the 50th anniversary of the 1969 occupation of Alcatraz. And it opened in 2019. And the museum was open for free for Indian people. And it was such a joy to see the galleries filled with native people at the Crocker Art Museum, which was, can I say, kind of a first. Uh, but it was also a day that was filled with sadness because a few months earlier, Frank himself had passed away from cancer. He saw every detail. We argued about many details. He saw every detail through. And Lauren Lipson, who had actually helped work with United Auburn to bring the funding for it, also passed away. Uh, so again, I think it's so important and we hope other people, including people in the audience and listening today, will take on the job of telling forward the story of California's important Native American contemporary art history. So if we can, let's explore a little bit about Frank. I, unfortunately, I never got a chance to, to meet him, did some research. And as you know, we dedicated a section in a gallery 
over here to him. But as I read more about him, he's really, he was really quite the Renaissance man. He, he did ceremony, song, writing, poetry, art. I mean, he did it all. So how was your experience with him working, working with that? So I met Frank again in the 1980s when he would come to Humboldt State to do visiting artist lectures, and he always had magic about him. And he always had a light touch, too. And he had incredible commitment and vision. And I'm not going to read it aloud, but if you look at the introduction to the catalog, he wrote it first and he hand wrote it out. And then he said, I've made some changes. I think you better come out to Sacramento and pick it out again. And I, and I would read it again. And it's like, it's the same one, Frank. This is the same draft. He said, no, I've added three words, but he wrote it out again. And that happened four or five times. He was so meticulous. And he balanced this vision of incredible poetry. So in it, he talks about as a little kid, what he remembers is the sparkling light reflected on the surface of water and death. And he said, those polarities shaped him as a person because of course at age five, when his father was killed, he was sent to Indian boarding school, taken away from his mother. He grew up in a, his first year was very traumatic there, uh, but grew up surrounded by the community, um, made key friends that supported him his whole life until he ran away from boarding school, but then again, searched out and was embraced by the Indian community in Northwestern California. And so he went to elders, he went to people like Wallace Burroughs, who was born in the 1880s, who had a completely different worldview and Frank ingested and became the carrier of this incredible rich tradition. So he was then part of, again, the renewal of ceremonies. Uh, Frank Day, who was here, was an advisor to um, his, the dance group, the Maidu traditionalists, uh, that was a dance company that Frank kept going. And so they in the roundhouses, um, you know, one thing I know is uh, Governor Jerry Brown wrote the preface for our catalog. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown's caregiver when he was young was a native woman. And Governor Jerry Brown loved Frank and said, you know, he has so much wealth to give. Um, so he was a poet, uh, he was passionate, he worked every day, sometimes he used his kitchen stove as his easel to hold a painting. You'd walk in, it's like, okay. <laughs> uh, so everything about the guy uh, was beautiful and um, we, were, we were deeply saddened that he uh, isn't walking the halls with us, but I'll tell you one more kind of magic story. Please. Uh, there was a wonderful exhibition that Frank was a part of at the Oakland Museum celebrating Frank Day. So why is Frank Day so key? Frank Day was the son of a ceremonial leader and he was a laborer, but after an injury, he took up painting as self-taught to retell the stories. But then he got involved in saying, art is a new way for us to share the stories. Art is a way for us, as Frank said, you know, we are still here. Art is a way to make, to visualize these things in a new way. Um, at the opening for a solo show of Frank Day, Frank Lapina came forward and said, and I'll sing a song for F Frank Day. And he sang the song and he finished the song. And then he went and talked to other people that he knew in the crowd. And everybody at the Oakland Museum said, is it on a loop? I still hear the song. Everybody said that. <clears throat> so oftentimes during this kind of I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but I did, I apologize. Oftentimes during these kind of talks, you know, we talk, then the last 15 minutes, you know, do we have any questions? And for me, I'm not a big fan of that style because I usually have a question five minutes in 
and I have to wait 40 minutes. I forget what the question is. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and we can address them as we move on. Also the same. And we have a, a floating mic that could be used. So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. In this section that we're in right here, native knowledge, one of the things I found interesting, and you, and you mentioned it, particularly with, with Frank Day's work, is the idea, to me, of turning, so I'm from the Plains, and these stories that sort of come down the line, get passed down through the generation. You know, when we're talking one-on-one -on -one or one in the group, and I'm telling you the story, in your mind's eye, you're picturing that story. So that picture in, as I'm telling you, that picture is gonna be slightly different for you, slightly different for you, slightly different for you, but we all get that narrative. And it's the way that we pass knowledge, right? But what makes this section native knowledge, particularly Frank's work, is he got these old school stories and painted them. And when you paint them, no longer does this sort of, I don't know, this interpretation that you have in your mind now becomes something visual that you can see. It becomes really how the um, storyteller intended it. And I find that, particularly with this work on this sidewall over here, really important of uh, when we're thinking about the transference of knowledge from one generation to another generation to another generation, and then one generation, Frank, Frank Day, paints it. So now it's, it becomes a lot more tangible. So is that an experience that you, that you have as you're working on this? Yeah, and it's, it's manifest in different ways. And so I know the audience watching online can't see everything that we're looking at right now. But as I look out, I'm seeing photographs by Dugan Aguilar next to a painting by Karen Noble. So the painting by Karen Noble is of a nebula, but she said when she looks at it, she sees the sky people. So there are stories on the Klamath River about the, the people that lived before the human beings came. And that at a certain point they moved to the sky. And Karen Noble for years has been painting the myths of the sky people. I mean, when I say years, I mean almost 50 years has been painting the myths of the sky people. But more recently, she's been looking at the nebula from the Hubble telescope. And she said, now I understand what I'm looking at. There they are. <laughs> uh, and next to that is a wonderful photograph by Dugan Aguilar. Dugan Aguilar is another one of these giants who has now passed on recently, but who left an archive of 2,000 photographs of Indian people, Indian places, ceremonies. Um, and Joe and I are working now to try to place some of these archives to make sure that they get recognition, that they aren't lost to history. But the image is of this rock that just shoots up. But the Indian community has a story about that rock. So everybody recognizes that rock. And the story is that a bear, grizzly bear, was chasing a deer and the deer managed to escape by leaping to the top of the rock. And they say, if you go to the rock today, you still see the claw marks of the bear against its side. So that every rock is alive with its story. And so, so I see this represented in different ways in this, in this room. Could you reference the two works that are behind you? Maybe those on Zoom are looking at it and that they're very, very different. I'm curious, I'm curious about. So she asked um, if Mark would discuss these two works sitting behind us. Um, Rabbit Strickland and Ojibwe from Minnesota. And I, so I can't read this. Harry Fonseca, sorry, my little, you want to, would you like to discuss these? Sure. So uh, Rabbit, 
Ojibwe doesn't sound like a California Indian tribe, but Rabbit was born in San Francisco. So another part of the history that we have to talk about is in addition to the descendants of the native cultures of California, we need to think about the fact that California was one of the capitals of the relocation termination program that was federal policy in the 1950s, where the US government paid people to move away from their homelands and renounce their tribal identity, renounce whatever treaty rights might have been given to them. So Rabbit, fam parents, took advantage of that. And the big centers for relocation were the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. So that's why California is the most populous state for Indian people in the country. So we think, oh, must be New Mexico, maybe, mm -hmm. or, you know, no, it's actually, it's our own California history. And about half the community is the indigenous tribal community, but at the other half is the relocation community and their descendants that came in the 1950s. And that's why we have the big American Indian centers throughout the state that were also like in Oakland, the Intertribal Friendship House. So Rabbit, same thing, wanted to learn about the stories of his people. So he, he's a self-taught artist, but he liked Michelangelo. And so he said, I see these super heroic figures. And, you know, I'm going to have to read the label to get, because I haven't, uh, refreshed it in my mind again, but it is, it's all the, we know the names. If I'm going to, let me see if it's right here and behind me. It's, uh, it figures, uh, the great hair, the great wind. And I, I can't quite see it right here, but it's, it's all the traditional stories. But again, you see them riding the great turtle, or Turtle Island and the bears. So it's it's a story um, from the Ojibwe. When? Yeah, and uh, the American Dream Machine. So, you know, Harry uh, always talked about his own background, you know, Maidu, Native Hawaiian. So, you know, there's an interesting mix going on there, but, you know, it's like, but what's our contemporary story too. And so one of the big contemporary stories is the fact that the world was changed when California, California voted to legalize Indian gaming. The American dream machine, this is casino story reality. So part of a new, and it certainly has transformed uh, because the, I mean, it's still the inequities. I, I won't get into the whole there's still incredible inequities, but there is some, I'm, you know, I'm so excited that there is some funding coming from casinos to help support their own community. Uh, and you can feel that there is positive that has come out of that. So you talk so passionately about this, and I'm wondering how this project has really impacted you personally. Uh, so I assume everybody in the room today is here because they have a story that has connected them to the California Indian community. And uh, everybody, I look forward to talking with you after to hear maybe you're native yourselves or you have made great connections, but there's no question my own life was transformed. Uh, and I'll just say one, one thing, which is, you know, we all live in different places uh, in our life. My parents are from Sweden. And for a thousand years, they're all from the same county in West Sweden. But then they made a big move, and then I made a big move. They moved to the East Coast, and then I moved to the West Coast. And I've lived here and there and there and there. And so, you know, you kind of lose track of people over time. After I moved to Humboldt County, that community has embraced me like family. 
in a way that is uh, totally different. Expectations are totally different. Uh, their commitment is totally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they are not necessarily familiar living with Native communities, is there is really, I was just reading about this the other day, there is really a different way of thinking. A lot of it is honor and a lot of it is gift. You know, even some of these communities, these Native communities that are extremely having, having extremely challenging times are still very giving. And I think people who aren't necessarily familiar with that or been around that are really touched and sometimes really shocked by it. So it's real, I think it's really, it's really an important aspect. And I think a lot of that further blossomed in California, as you mentioned before, particularly with relocation. And particularly, I think, as it sort of come out with, with Alcatraz, when Alcatraz happened in 1969. Um, and in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I was born in Oakland. I was born, um, my tribe is from Montana. My grandfather was sent to the Bay Area through relocation. And then my father followed him. So I was born in Oakland and um, my father was at Alcatraz and I was at Alcatraz. I'm not saying I was old at Alcatraz. <laughs> I was six, but I was, you know, I was thinking at the time, because, you know, you're six years old, right? And I was thinking, all right, now let me get this straight. All these Indians are overpacking these boats to go to a prison on an island involuntarily, <laughs> or excuse me, voluntarily. So it took me the longest time to figure out what is going, you know, six years old, what is going on here? But it wasn't until much later I started to appreciate that experience. And part of that experience was also one of the main drivers of this exhibition, right? So I wonder if you can discuss that a little bit. Yeah, well, uh, again, I'm so happy to see some old friends uh, showing up today. So, you know, welcome old friends. Um, so Alcatraz, not only, I'm, I'm going to just jump, you know, Alcatraz was an art project after the American Indian center burned down in 1969 under suspicious conditions, Earl Livermore, who was an artist who was exhibiting at that time with a new group of artists uh, that included R.C. Gorman, who was living in San Francisco at the time. He went to San Francisco State, where I work, and supported himself as a model, hard to believe. Uh, and and uh, and the guy we just talked about in the corner, uh, Swazo Hines. They were exhibiting together, and then after it burned, they said, we're going to have an, we'll make it an art project. We're going to have art on Alcatraz. And the Quidiquit sisters, uh, Denise Quidiquit, who some of you will remember, worked at American Indian Contemporary Art Center, and her sister, Lawanda, were doing potato prints out on Alcatraz with the kids. So you maybe were invited to do potato prints uh, with the Quidiquits. Um, and there were so, it was a cultural expression. And of course, John Trudell, uh, you know, I was speaking with a friend about, I should have done my homework so I could name all the artists in this show who all traveled out to Alcatraz. And I, I can't name them all right now, but it's, it's significant. People would come down and make that trip themselves. So they were, um, it, was a, it was a cultural reawakening and simultaneously as you alluded to in the beginning um you know the language the ceremonial restoration things were happening and after alcatraz then there was the pit river occupation in 1970 the same group of people were involved and then of course uh wounded knee and uh leonard peltier is still in prison mm -hmm. so i guess walk going to dc the longest walk yeah. in the 70s. And so a lot of this is, um, you know, the backdrop for what we're seeing here. And of course, the, the, this is artwork, you know, this is, you know, not 
about politics, but it's about culture. And it's one part of what all of these artists were involved in. Sometimes I don't know how to organize an art show when it's so complicated because people are involved in a range of cultural expression, including traditional expression, political expression, and aesthetic. So here we get a glimpse. I wanna ask Joe to talk about the fantastic way the exhibition has been laid out here at the Autry because it's so exciting and it's very different from how it was laid out in Sacramento. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the exhibition came to us when we started installing it in probably the first half of 2020. And when I, well, well first it was, it was right in the middle of the pandemic and this is where it gets a little bit complicated is when I, when the materials were sent to us, it was all digital. And when I, when I went, went over the material, I realized that the exhibition was organized for an art museum, where the Autry is not an art museum, right? We're a museum of the West, we're a little bit of everything. So it was important to me that I tweak it and modify it because we tell multiple stories of the West. So we wanted to make sure that our non-native audience can get their head around it. So our native audience can embrace it. So we modified it. I changed some of the panels. Um, I tried to make it, I'm trying to figure out, I, I tried to make it so when the visitor comes, they are looking into it and experiencing it as opposed to being objective. And I think part of that on the wall, we added quotes. So for example, one of them is advocacy. So I wanted when, when our norm, when, when our visitor comes in and you think about either cultural reclamation or advocacy or activism, they're coming in it with a certain definition in their head. What I wanted to do is like, well, let's talk to native people who are very active and ask them what that word means to them. So you'll notice along the wall, we added quotes. So our visitor can sort of compare these two. That was real important to us um, to ensure that we bring a, a tangibility to our visitor to help them sort of move to a different level. And also the thing that we added is we, uh, on this far side over here, we'll, we'll take a look at it a bit later, is we wanted to add a section that uh, honors Frank. As Frank is just was just a phenomenal, I feel a little bad. I really, I really wish I had a chance to meet him. Um, it's just what I look at talking with his family and his, his children and reading and looking at his artwork. He was just a phenomenal man. And I really wanted to find an opportunity to, to honor him. So uh, FYI, the exhibition here closes March 14th. So we have a question here and also one on Zoom. Okay. Well, I think it really worked. I came not because I have a connection to uh, Native heritage, but because I love the Autry. I came a week ago to see if you were still alive after the pandemic, walked in here and was so overwhelmed that I couldn't watch the whole thing. It was so powerful. Mm. So I bought the book and decided to come back. My question is, those paragraphs helped me so much understand the background. And I was so disappointed that they're not in the book, that the book has very little background to the pictures, a little bit more about who's, who's actually drawing them or creating them. So that's my, my question. And also there's more in the book than has been presented here, isn't there? There's more art there. Yeah. And so that's because you couldn't squeeze it in. Yeah, and, and thank you for the question. And Oftentimes the catalog will show the works and have one narrative. And sometimes the gallery will have a related narrative that is slightly different. Some of the labels came with the show and some of the labels uh, text we generated. So I always like to think about um, when, it, when a visitor walks through an exhibition, they can approach it three different ways. And it's important to me that they get something out of each one of those ways. One of them is I'm not going to read a damn thing. I'm just going to walk around the gallery, look at the works and enjoy them. 
right? That's one way. Second way is I'm going to walk through the gallery, read the panels and read all the labels. They get something out of that. And another way is I'm going to walk through the exhibition, read the panels, read the labels, and with the catalog in hand. So I always like to, because, you know, every visitor has their own different way they want to experience it. We can't assume that they're going to read everything. So the way that was organized, that's that's kind of how we approach it. And to make it more complicated, we got a great designer here. His name is Gene. I, it took us a couple months to install this, but because when it happened, it was happening during the pandemic and we were not allowed to come into the museum. So three quarters of this process, I never saw the works in person. They had a, <laughs> they had a little cart with a, with a, uh, a laptop and with a camera. And so I'd be sitting at home staring at, staring at, the la staring at my laptop and I'd say, move to the left, move to the left, move it to the right, zoom back. And it wasn't until sort of the final stages, I actually got to come in and see, see the works in person. It's, it's, I have, I've been fortunate enough to be in the museum field since the early nineties, but installing this, um, was a very, was a very unique experience, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I think it turned out, it turned out well. And maybe I'll add a PS too, which is, um, so Frank has walked on, but he's sitting with us today right here. And, uh, he said so many times, um, the artist is more important than the theme. So when we do this book, I want to start out with the profiles of the artists as the priority. And first he said, this show, we're just going to have it be this killer book with 10 artists. And I want a picture of them looking dignified and then their work. And then the second one, he said, because the th people always make the artist secondary to the theme. So he said, I want to make this the artist first. So if you look at the catalog, usually, you know, the profiles of the artist might come at the end. But this book, the profile of the artist comes at the very front and the biographies, et cetera. And even when it came to the essays, you know, he was he said, you know, these are the kind of topics. So, you know, he and it's partly coming from an art background. Uh, so anyway, I think that is another reason. But we always intended that the, what we call the chats or the didactic texts would accompany the works in the exhibition. So uh, we're happy they're here. So now, we do have a question. We do have a question online that relates wonderfully to this part of the conversation. How has the exhibition been received by both critics and the general public considering the pandemic? Also, are there any future plans for When I Remember I See Red in the future? And that is from Christopher Robinson Catter, who is the widower of Kevin Mushka Catter, who is an artist featured here. He also asked for clarification. The exhibition does run through November 14th here at the Autry. So it'll be closing on the 14th. Hmm. Um it is my understanding we are the last venue. The show opened up here, um, and it was actually a time, the original run of the show, if, if we we were fortunate enough, we worked with the Crocker, and they were really great with this, for us to extend the exhibition until November 14th, here just, well, just in a few weeks, I guess. But if we didn't have a chance, if it wasn't extended, nobody would ever saw it. It's because during the pandemic and everything was closed, we installed everything, we worked on it. And then by the time it was it would have been closed, um, the museum still wasn't open. So we're very fortunate that it was um, that we got a chance to extend it. But it's my understanding this is the last venue. Um, there was a good article about it in the New York, in the Los Angeles Times. Um, so that's always good. And as my understanding has been reason, reasonably well received. Children come. Unfortunately, to answer that from someone who's here on the floor a lot, uh, due to the pandemic situation, there haven't been a lot of school groups coming to the museum as uh, field trips have not been happening. But I can say that the majority of visitors who have come to the museum over the last few months have been coming for this exhibition. 
So they've been explicit about that at the, at the desk. And for those of you who are online and not able to attend right now, the exhibition is available uh, to see on the website uh, in large part, and also the catalog that we're referencing is available to purchase from the museum store, both in person and online, just to get that plug in there. Yeah, and I'll mention uh, the, the question that just came in um, was from the partner of Mushka. And so Mushka has the four kinky kachinas around the corner. Uh, so again, what has California contributed, you know, so much? Certainly we've talked about the revitalization of the traditional cultures of the indigenous California people that uh, are now, you know, you've been reading, I'm sure, about the controlled burns and native perspective on the control burns, you know, things are, are starting to be taken seriously in a new way. But in an urban context, uh, the gay American Indians movement and American Indians with AIDS movement, and Mushka was involved with the American Indians with AIDS movement, um, and it's now passed away. Uh, but, you know, a really important cultural contribution that had national impact uh, one of the things that the group did was to um, reassert the use of the word two-spirited um, because the previous, there had been the word burdash, which has kind of a colonialist history. And uh, so many interesting stories are kind of interwoven with the arts. The, I th the labels that you refer to may be on the website because we, as Ben mentioned, we put a lot of work into the website thinking people may not be able to see it. So the website is very, very deep in the sense of the exhibition. So maybe what we should do shortly is walk around, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, maybe you can talk about one of your favorite works. I can talk about one of mine, but I have one question for you. Okay. So considering this is a doozy, just going to let you know. Considering your multi-decade work in native art and your close relationship with so many California native artists, what is the future? It seems to me that California native art is very much gaining momentum. It be, it's becoming really, ref, um, I don't want to say refined, but that's the only word that I can think of. It's coming very community, but also at the same time, statewide. What are, what are your thoughts about the future of California native art? I hope you're right. Um, I am somebody who have seen, you know, I remember 1992 very well. 1992 was billed as the quincentennial of Christopher Columbus. And everybody wanted to have American Indian profiling uh, profiles as part of their programming in 1992. So there was a huge flurry of activity. Right now, we're in the BIPOC moment, Black, Indigenous, people of color moment, I think. And I think, again, all of us that are interested have to work together uh, to make sure that those who have walked on are remembered become involved with archives, become involved with museums to be advocates for this important culture. This is a rare thing to see all this work at a major museum, a sole, an exhibition solely dedicated uh, so, uh, to contemporary Native American art. And I'll just talk about Frank for a minute. For this show, he said, because he did a lot of things. He said, for this show, you know, we could do a whole show on California Indian jewelry. We could do a whole show on California Indian carving, regalia work, feather work. You know, there's many different kinds of shows that could happen. But this one, he said, let's just focus on those who made a career as contemporary artists. Um, so, again, I think uh, it's all of our responsibility to partner and work together and uh, see what we can help manifest in the future. And I'm again, so honored to work with you and work with this museum and work with Rick before you. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason this is happening here is because of Rick West, of course, who played a critical role in even shaping this institution. So, uh, excuse me, this, well, the institution, but this exhibition. I also want to mention Christina Gilmore, uh, 
at the Crocker was another critical voice who said, let's make sure women are well represented here. So there's been a number of people who have had uh, valuable contributions. That was one of the, when we received the exhibition, we added that section in the very beginning, first light. We thought it was important. So when people first came in, particularly the size of those paintings, the paintings and the sculpture, they're just so big. So when visitors came into the museum, we wanted them we wanted them to hit it right off the bat so they got a piece of it to be able to go in there. It's really, really, those two works there are just powerful. All right, you want to, should we get up and walk around a bit? Sure. Okay. Do you have a um, particular work that you'd like to talk about? Uh, you go first. Oh boy, okay, all right. Well, if it's for me, we're gonna go, we're gonna go all the way down. Rob, are we okay? Oh, there you are, hi. All right, so we're going to come on all the way down here. And I think you can pack a chair if you want to take a chair with you. So I think this work right here, North Mountain by Frank LaPena, is certainly one of my favorites. And I honestly don't know why. I can't give you some kind of art historical background that the reason why I like it. I just, I, I love it because how it makes me feel. So as we look at this, we can see the mountain, Mount Shasta, which is a holy mountain. And above, we see this large bird. For my traditions, from the plains, we'd call this a thunderbird, a real important bird. And we can see as it rises up or above the mountain, and it's spreading out its wings. And we know this is an important event. We know that this is a holy event because we can see it's dark above and we can see the stars. And as the bird comes up, we can see the sun is either rising or setting by Frank's use of color. And this power, this spiritual power of the bird comes down to the mountain. And Frank emphasized that the way he used his paint. We can see how he put it on there. It drips down like this. It's almost as though as a spiritual power from this bird and this sacred mountain is coming down on us. And the size of it, how it's a triptych, how the stars along the above and this use of color on each side, it's a phenomenally, at least for me, phenomenally powerful work. And of course, um, you know, on this back side over here, one, two, three, four, it almost feels as though Frank is using and experimenting with color by the way that it is using these, these cross symbols. We can see on the left, it's more abstract. We see the cross and how he's using color all the way across. He's just, it's just a phenomenal, a phenomenal artist, um, a phenomenal painter. You have one you like to look at? Well, I'll talk about two in this room and then we'll move. Sure. That's okay. So two in this room. Uh, we were talking about, Joe was just talking about this as a spiritual painting, which it absolutely certainly is. And again, it's based, it reflects a mythological uh, reality. And I'm thinking right now, because I'm from Northern California, where we're experiencing a tremendous rain, and that's a great blessing, but it's also a great uh, source of concern with all the burn areas and with this incredible rain here, I, I, uh, I'm prompted to think about all of that. But the painting right here, the Hesse, the big head ceremony too. I mean, if you hadn't seen the size of the headdress used for the Hesse, which is 
three feet in all directions. You wouldn't necessarily know that that was a specific California ceremonial feather headdress, uh, but it comes alive in this semi-abstract uh, vision because Frank's vision was, yes, as an artist, and he, was, he used the word abstraction a lot, but he was very much a spiritual and traditional person. Um, I'm just going to point out this eight-part lithograph on the far wall here, the history of California Indians. So he made a lithograph and made a number of impressions with, you can tell it's got a uh, arrowhead for a nose, but it's clearly recognizable as a skull. And if you read what is told on every panel, uh, this is what I think educators are trying to bring into uh, our education that and as Jerry Brown wrote in the, in the catalog introduction, Jerry Brown says, we got to remember 90% of the state's population was wiped out. This was an incredible Holocaust. But we take inspiration because we're going to have to learn to be survivors with the climate change reality that's impacting us today, just as the survival and now flourishing of the American Indian community has been such a beautiful thing to watch unfold. And so it's all these terrible things that have happened with the smallpox and the missions that are told on each one. But the very last panel, Frank thanks the elders that he learned from so that he could put the story back together again. And for me, that's an incredibly powerful and magnificent piece. But I'll move us back into another gallery to talk Please. about one other artist. I mean, there's a lot. And I think I'll go here. So I'll talk about Brian Tripp. So Brian Tripp is a Karuk Indian, still with us, age 76, uh, now living with his nephew uh, and in hospice care. And uh, there are several friends of Brian's in the house today, so that's why I wanted to uh, recognize that. So uh, this first piece on the left is entitled, The Best Things in Life Are Not Free, because he means that to have a poetic resonance. And he said he was inspired by seeing a basket woven by Datsolali, Louisa Kaiser, reproduced in a book about the Washoe weavers. And Datsolali had named a funerary basket that was reproduced in that book all my friends are dead and dying. And Brian Tripp said it hit him like a blast that he could use the language of indigenous basket design, but give them the poetic title that made the content that he was thinking about clear. So the best things in life are not free means that you are not just free to take and abuse and waste everything. You make things better as you go. So here we've got the spiral of the baskets and the fire and the ceremonial dancers and everything because there's a different way, in an abstract way, there's a different way to think about the earth. And then the second piece I'll talk about, Brian's, which is here, which is um, when squares straightened out circles. And it's a kind of a weird piece, right? Because there's a plumb bob suspended from the ceiling that's attached to a bag of pennies. And just like all of us, you know, you got pennies in your pocket, you drop it in the bag sometimes. Well, when it got heavy enough, he said he wanted to make an image to remind people that it was only in 1852 when California was surveyed for the first time. And then the cycle that was seasons and the cycle that was ceremonies 
got turned into private property that could be sold and developed. And so that's why it's all the circle is attached to the bag of pennies on the other side. So again, that kind of poetic thinking to mapping, thinking about California in a different way. All right, I have I have one more that I'll talk about. <laughs> then we'll all right. So we're gonna go around the corner. Sorry. The good news is we're getting our steps in today. In this work is actually a, a little, it's just, it's just pink one right here, inner world. It's a, it's a, I'll be honest, it's a little bit of an embarrassing story. So when the exhibition came and they sent the digital images, you're, you're often asked to give a tour, right? <clears throat> and what I often do is I pick, you know, one from each section that I know really well. And I can use that as my tour. So I'll go to this one, I'll go to this one, I'll go to this one. And this was one of them. So when I saw it on my computer screen, for some reason, my mind thought it was that big. <laughs> but in fact, it's really tiny. So the first time I gave a tour, I was like, um, and giving a tour to some people, I don't remember. So we're going in and moving around the gallery. And, you know, I, I kind of see this, but I didn't remember. I come strutting around the corner here and I saw it and I'm going, oh. So anyway, so this is the basis. <laughs> it was extremely awkward, but now I like it so much, I figured that uh, is what it is. So this is by Dalbra Castro. This is called The Inner World. Ceremony. This is about the space within ceremony. You can see the black, that's the flicker feather, which is used on a headdress. Now within this ceremonial world, when you're going through ceremony, there is a connection between you, your community, and the creator. And as you start going through a ceremony, whether it's fasting, whatever the case may be, these things start to align. They start to come together. And in your mind and in your spirit, you start to enter this different place. And you come to this place that you share with your ancestors because your ancestors also went through the ceremony. So as we look at this, this is why I was thinking it was this big. But at some point when you come closer and you look at it, it's just this connection that you are making with all these different things around you, the creator, your family, your ancestors, the spiritual world, and it all connects together, 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 together. Can I do one more, please? <laughs> this is a work by Leatrice Mickelson. Leatrice grew up in San Francisco of mixed heritage, Wyandotte, and Navajo or Diné people. And so Oregon and uh, Southwest. But when she was in high school, it was the, during the World War II years, and she was living with her dad and went to high school inside the Japanese American internment camp. And she said, you can imagine the irony for me as a native person to go into the incarceration for my high school, but I got to go home at the end of the day to be with my family. But I was aware of this. And so she said, so throughout my life, I'm going to use ink because they trained us in ink painting at the internment camp when I was in high school. And so she said, this is my vision of, again, storm clouds over the hills, but done as an ink painting. Leatrice became the first curator of the American Indian Contemporary Art no, excuse me, of the American Indian Historical Society in San Francisco. And she started curating these exhibitions in the 1960s of people like Linda Loma Hoftawa, Frank Lapina, R.C. Gorman, Patro Suazo Hines, that was really a spark for the contemporary art scene that we're seeing today. So I like to think about Leatrice, who's no longer with us, as somebody who embraced 
a really diverse view of America. So before, I'll send over here. So before we go, and I'm not going to point it out, but just on the back side of this, which we added to the exhibition, is the Alcatraz logbook, which I believe captures about a third of the people who were there. So the logbook was at the pier. Some people would sign in before they went out to the island. On the page that's open now, as you open it up, look on the right-hand side. I think it's line 34 or line 33 is Wilma Mankiller's signature. My father, uh, we can't see it on this one, but his signature is there. Um, it's a phenomenal, important piece of history. So it certainly makes sense to have it within this exhibition, particularly in Frank's section. We'd like to thank everybody for, for attending and thank you, Mark, for this great program, exhibition, and thank you to the Native artists who have shared their important stories with us. When I remember I See Red closes here November 14th, the catalog is available at our store if you're interested. And if you're really interested, I'm sure our good friend here, Mark, if you get a catalog, would be more than happy to sign it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Please be safe and have a good day.